Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the Rocky Top Rewind VolQuest.com podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. So glad that you could join us today on the podcast. One fun game that we're going to jump back and look at today, the 1995 Tennessee-Alabama game. Obviously, uh, Joey Ken, a big part of that game, and, and Peyton, man, there's so much to talk about. We'll dive into that. We'll be joined uh, by Joey Kent a little later in the podcast to get his recollection of not just that play, but uh, the pregame, the locker room afterwards, what he was doing in his dorm that night after he got back, and the next day, pretty good chat, pretty fun chat with Joey Kent. We'll have a little bit later in the podcast. But I'm joined by Jesse Simonton, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price to talk about this game. Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, to say the monkey was off Tennessee's back this night would be the understatement because it was a dominating performance over a team that had, had dominated you and beat you really in every possible fashion. Yeah, and and during a time when Tennessee had some good teams, you know, late eighties, early nineties, even you know with the success that they had, uh, you know, majors those couple of years, he Shuler, just that was the the one element that was missing from from Tennessee. I think really turning the corner as a program because I mean they were quite frankly still you know. Alabama's little brother in, in, in the confines of the SEC. And, um, I mean, I remember vividly this game and just kind of how, how cathartic it was for Tennessee fans to, uh, I mean, not, not just get the win, but to do it in the fashion they, that they did in Legion Field. Just, you know, the from the first play of the game, the 80-yard touchdown from Peyton to Joey Kent to, um, you know, the way you answered the bell in, in the second half when Bama, you know, threatened to put together a little comeback. It was just emphatic. It was dominant. And, and for a Tennessee fan base that had not won this game in a decade, it was a really big deal. Well, you know, I mean, you had, you, you know, Brent, I think when I look back, I mean, every quarterback, going back to Andy Kelly, Kelly kind of couldn't get past Alabama. He couldn't get past Alabama. Then you had Peyton who couldn't get past Florida. Carson couldn't get past Georgia. But for this game, it was – it, it, was, it was, to me, a huge coming out party for Peyton, but just the whole team in general. Tennessee had been close in 93. Of course, they tie there, David Palmer with the two-point conversion. Close game in, in 94, but then 95, they didn't just beat Alabama. They destroyed them, and, and everybody can say, yeah, from play number one, but it really was from play number one, they just beat up Alabama in, in, in what was a cigar-smoked Legion field as every Tennessee fan mayor lived about 12. Uh, and, and made it for a smoky, uh, smoky close to uh, what was not the third Saturday in October, but it was actually the second Saturday in October. Jesse, what about, the, you know, upon watching this game, I'm sure you had seen some highlights but had not watched the game. What, what stood out to you about what Tennessee did on this night? Yeah, well, I mean, I knew about the Joey Kent first play, 80 yards, getting a little pick from the referee and, and kind of sprinting to the end zone and that, that, that kind of starting the celebration from play one. Uh, you know, I'd seen that the, the, most people, I think, in a lot of the highlight reels have seen kind of the Peyton Manning bootleg. But watching it from start to finish and kind of listening to the, you know, the, the old school announcing crew with Ron Franklin and, you know, game day was there. And so the, the kind of understanding the aspect and, and kind of uh, the magnitude of this game for Tennessee and what it meant to kind of peel the monkey off the back. But, you know, we kind of discussed this right before we got on. I mean, to me, this was kind of like the all-caps Peyton Effing Manning game where he, like, uh, now was officially kind of the dude, and he kind of helped ignite these next three to four years. They had a stat in that game right towards the end that it was only the second time up through uh, his career that a Gene Stallings team had gave, uh, had allowed 300 yards to a passer. Uh, Manning accounted for four touchdowns. There was other stars in this game, no doubt. You know, Jay Graham had the big 75-yard touchdown. Terry Fair came up with an interception. Leonard Little was a beast. Uh, but to me, it was, you know, this was when Peyton Manning officially became kind of the dude. Everyone knew who he was as a recruit. He'd won a big game as a freshman. But that he kind of put himself and maybe Tennessee on the map for these next three or four years, you know, through 98. Well, I think you're exactly right because a the, the week earlier or two weeks earlier they had played – Arkansas and, and Arkansas's defensive coordinator was Joe Lee Dunn, who had been a defensive coordinator at multiple stops in the SEC, and he was the blitzing guys from everywhere, Mr. Exotics, and all those things. And then it was fast forward to Brother Oliver at Alabama, who was, you know, had a great reputation as a defensive coordinator that, you know, he really rattled quarterbacks and he confused quarterbacks. And so much of the talk going in was, could Peyton handle? this type of defense like he did against Joe Lee Dunn, which he really tore him up. Could he handle 
Brother Oliver because nobody had been able to kind of figure him out. And Jesse, I think you're right. This is when you got a glimpse of Peyton Manning as a student. You know, he's playing the chess game with Brother Oliver, and Peyton had all the moves on the night. He made all the right moves. His checks were good. Obviously, David Cutcliffe called a great game. But Peyton seemingly always got Tennessee in the right play when you watch this game. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and they talk a lot in the early in the broadcast, you know, uh, how much the film study had helped Peyton, you know, with his dad, Archie, uh, you know, coming all the way up through high school. But then even, you know, the, the, the kind of growth he had made. And, and you guys obviously saw this firsthand. Brent, you were in the stadium. You know, the growth he'd made from a freshman to a sophomore. And I think it was evident. Uh, it was evident from play one. You know, I mean, that's a funny play it's kind of looking back at anyways when you think about how football's kind of evolved and, and the modernization of the spread and the different formations. Tennessee's in a four-wide, one-back, so 10 personnel, but they're under center, which is just something you don't see a lot with that particular formation. Four receivers, they go spread, but he, Peyton is still under center. He takes his drop. You know, the, 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 the two slot guys can't. Uh, and the other guy on the other side, they're running the, the, the straight verts with bubbles on the outside. Peyton sees it immediately, uh, and Kent was off to the races. And I mean, it, that was pretty much ball game. I think there was. We can discuss some other key moments. There's probably one play in particular that caught my mind. That hey, Alabama had a chance to get back in it, missed huge opportunity. But other than that, you know, this was all Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee starts out fast. They get out of the gate with the first play. Then they came back and were pretty methodical uh, on the on the next drive, uh, just kind of carving people up. And I mean, the the uh, Rob the the post corner that he threw to Mar that Peyton threw to Marcus oh, Nash. Oh, wow. yeah. uh, yeah. That's as good of a throw. I mean, Peyton's made a lot of great throws in his career. You don't throw over 500 touchdown pass in the NFL, so you can't say that was his best throw. But for a sophomore at that point in time, Rob, we had not seen a Tennessee quarterback put that ball there. That was the Steve Spurrier route that Florida had thrown against Tennessee for umpteen touchdowns for two or three years in a row. You know what I mean? That was a thing of beauty. And it was and it was a third and ten play too. I mean that's a I mean that's a huge play there in the first quarter. I mean there's a lot of difference of being up ten nothing or fourteen nothing. I mean you know, I, I think it we can all probably agree Tennessee, you know, wins no matter what, but that throw right there was an exclamation point. You know, all of a sudden Alabama's down fourteen nothing after just two possessions. And man, it was it was a real pleasure to watch you know to watch Peyton and just you know really remember how just just how good he was. I mean, it was it, it was remarkable how quick he got rid of the football, how decisive he was. Just um, you know, I I watched him closely for all those years, but really haven't gone back and other than just seeing highlights here and there, haven't gone back and watched the whole game. And uh, man, it that, it was fun. It it really was fun just to see how in, in control he was for a, you know a 19 year old kid playing the, that position. Yeah, I mean, on that second drive, guys, he was 5 of 7 for 74 yards. I mean, you know. And he had a drop. After two, yeah, after two after two drives, he was 6 of 8 for 154 and two touchdowns. And, 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 he, had and that one, he had that one throw, AP, where he really showed off that arm strength that everyone obviously came to know and understand in the NFL for the next, you know, 15 years when he throws that hitch that Ford tries to dive, and it's just late because he doesn't think that the quarterback has enough juice on it. And it go, you know, the play goes thirty some odd yards to kind of get Tennessee, you know, in the scoring position before he makes this, you know, next dime throw to Nash. Yeah, and then he comes back and the drive at the end of the first half I thought was pivotal for Tennessee too. Austin, go ahead. Oh, I, 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 I mean, he, he was the maestro. Yeah, he absolutely was. I mean, he he was. I mean, he was pulling. He was pulling all the strings, and, and he was play, he played the band at the end of the night, but he was playing the band uh, dur during that game as well. I think the other thing that surprised me in, in rewatching this game and, and looking back at it was we talk so much about finding your five offensive linemen and finding the continuity and guys playing beside each other and how big of a deal that is, and you know you, you can't you can't be shuffling guys around. They Tennessee shuffled their offensive line starting line lineup that year, sometimes week to week, and they had shuffled it from the previous week, Rob, to that week. They made three moves on the offensive line in yeah, that, I, to start that game. I didn't notice it myself until they said Jeff Smith at center, and I was like, well, what? And, yeah, that's when, that's when it, it occurred to me that they were uh, jumbling things around. I had the same thought you did. But then, you know, Philip, um, I mean, that was 
just kind of something that he did he was comfortable with. So I don't really think it was that, that unique, for um, especially his early years. Do you? No, certainly not. Uh, but it is, it is a bit unusual that you would do it in that game. You know, because, you know, here's all Tennessee fans. Everybody's all, all gooed up. I mean, can you win that game? Can you pull it off? Can you actually end the streak? Okay, yeah, we're going to go win. Let's reshuffle our offensive line for this game. And we're winning. I mean, we've beaten Arkansas and won other games. But our better matchups for this game are to move three guys on the offensive line, uh, which is really uh, kind of unheard of and something nobody seems, you know, nobody does these days because everybody's talking about all the continuity and everything else. Of course, you, we talk about Peyton and the receivers and everything, but, of course, Jay had a big game, had the huge run, of course, would – you know, do it again back to back years in '96. Um, so I mean, you know, again, this was just complete domination. Whether it be running it, throwing it, you know, defensively, Leonard Little, um, you know, just just an impressive showing from a Tennessee team that you know, and it so it happens so much in, in games like this. A lot of times when you when you struggle against the team and you finally break down the wall, you break it down big time. And so, especially for a team that had as much talent as Tennessee did in in '95. Well, I've forgotten you how. I was just, I'd forgotten really how big Jay's run was. I mean, I knew that he had it and that it, you know, kind of slammed the door. I'd sort of forgotten that it was essentially the first play after Alabama had scored to cut it to 28-14 with you know still two or three minutes left in the in the in the third quarter. I mean, if Tennessee goes three and out right there, Bama could really have a chance to get some momentum. So that I mean, that was an enormous run by Jay. Well, and Tennessee was terrible on third down in this game. You know, we we noted he, Peyton had the two touchdowns on third down, the, the the throw to Nash and then his bootleg. But other than that, they didn't actually convert a third down after that bootleg touchdown the rest of the game, which is why they had to settle for some field goals late. Uh, but that, that Jay Graham touchdown, untouched 75 yards around the corner, uh, obviously a key moment. I, I think to me the, the probably the biggest what-if play, re, you know, we're watching this game, you, you guys re-watching it, was there's about five minutes left in the second quarter. Tennessee's up 21-7. to seven. The offense has kind of slowed down a little bit. Um, Bama has a little bit of momentum here. It's third and 11, third and 12. They get pressure on Peyton. He's flushed. He makes easily his worst throw of the game. He throws it right to Kevin Jackson, and it was going to be a pick six. That was going to be 21-14, and Jackson just dropped the ball. And yes. That that was a huge like oh because then Tennessee survives they punt Peyton actually hit, a, avoids a sack fumble on the next series and they, you know he's able to jump on it and they score a touchdown later on the drive but the pick six was like you know who, th- th- there's a lot of what ifs in every game there's you know one potential one or two turning points and that was th- th- that was it for Alabama once they kind of missed that opportunity it seemed like uh, it kind of went by the wayside for their chances to win after that. Well, and I remember being in the booth, uh, in the Vol Network booth for that game, and I remember that play at that moment. You kind of looked, you know, you looked at each other and said, you know, maybe this is Tennessee's night because Tennessee fans remember the 90 game where you're lining up for a game-winning field goal and it's blocked so bad and so hard that Alabama gets to line up for a game-winning field goal um, on the very next play to end the game to win 9-6. And, Tennessee's got the lead in 93 in, in Legion Field, and they can't get the stop on, on fourth, you know, on, on defense. And uh, it ends up David Palmer on the, on the bootleg or on the two point conversion, as Austin had mentioned earlier. You just kind of wondered at that point, was this really Tennessee's night? Because that's been a play, you know, if Tennessee had made a mistake like that, you felt like the previous nine years, there's no way Alabama's not capitalizing, capitalizing on it. And there was a couple of plays in a key moment there that Tennessee withstood the storm. Uh, and, and then obviously Jay put the, you know, put the nail in the coffin, if you will, in, in the third quarter and put that game away. I'm with you, Jesse. I remember that play vividly. And you, everybody, every Tennessee fan took a big exhale at that point. Went, wow. You know, because well, you're, just, well, you're just waiting for something bad to happen because it had always happened against Alabama badly. Well, of course, coming back, coming up later on in the podcast, we'll talk to Joey Kent and talk to him about Jay's run and what it meant to him that night and uh, just kind of get a look at, at everything that, you know, uh, transpired uh, leading up to it and then uh, obviously uh, through the game and then even what it's meant to him after the fact. He's been able to take his kids back down to Birmingham um, and, and, and talk to, uh, to them about, you know, what a special spot um, for his football career Legion Field was. 
Well, they, flashed was. The st- they flashed the stat in that game on the ESPN broadcast, which was pretty fan- uh, amazing. After Jay hit that run, 75 yards, it put him over 100 yards. He was at like right around 111, uh, finished, I think, with something like 115 or 120 in the game. But they, ESPN flashed up a stat that said the Tennessee, through the 90s at that point, was 31-1-2 and two when a player rushed – when they had an individual running back rush for over a hundred yards. And I think that, you know, that stat only probably continued to grow uh, from there because of the running backs that were coming the next few years when Tennessee was just ripping off wins. So pretty, pretty impressive stat to, to begin with, but then it only, you know, that, that stat only grew after that. Yeah, it, it, it did. And Tennessee was dominant there. I want to talk about defense in just a second, a couple other things about the, the, the landscape significance of this win. But first, I need to tell you a little bit more about Blue Water Climate Control. Allergy season is here. Allergy sufferers will be looking for uh, safe air space. Do you know that pollutants in your home are two to ten times worse than the outdoors? Blue Water Climate Control offers solutions that protect your airspace in a variety of ways. For more information on that, you can call Blue Water Climate Control at 865-299-2290. That's 865 865- 299-2290. Don't forget to mention VolQuest and find out more about what Blue Water Climate Control can do for you to help you during this allergy season. Again, you can check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. You knew Leonard Little was a good player, okay? I mean, he, he had made plays. He had done different things. But the, the hit on Bergdorf and what he did in this game uh, was, was dominant and was really good. I mean, you talk about guys Tennessee's had that's been able to change the game and change a series, change the fortunes of a quarter. Leonard could do that better than anybody. I thought he was ter- – he played well against Alabama his whole career. I thought he was terrific in this game, though, when you go back and watch it. Maybe he didn't have a bunch of sacks, but Alabama had to know where, know where he was every snap, and that's really got started kind of in that October stretch in 95 for his career. Oh, he, he was super disruptive, sack. super disruptive in this game. And, and – and- you know, you're right. They had to account for him on every play. And, and you know, you're right. Not You're talking about sacks. To me, that that's a, you know, sure, that's a nice stat. But it, to me, it's how disruptive can you be and how much can you influence how they play offense, how the quarterback makes decisions. And, and really, you're right. Each year against Alabama, he had a huge hand in influencing not only Bergdorf, but eventually Freddie Kitchens. And so, I mean, Leonard was, was – spectacular uh not only in 95 but you know the next two years as well well he decapitated Birdorf in that game I mean Birdorf literally ended up leaving the game you know I mean on that yeah. sack fumble uh and and funny stat about Freddie Kitchens that I saw after watching this game and reading some stuff I actually found this on the Alabama uh in their history on the, going through a deep dive on their history uh on their team website he, at that point, I don't know if it's been broken since then. Um, obviously, they haven't thrown it a ton under Saban, but, but Tua might have might have come close one or two times, perhaps. I don't know. But he set the all-time record in this game because they were obviously trailing uh, from, the, from the jump. He set the all-time Alabama record in this game, Freddie Kitchens, for attempts, 43 attempts, and he didn't even start the game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you wow, what, that's, Chuck, that's a great stat. Go ahead, Rob. The two things that jumped out at me – from the defensive side, and these are X and O things, but just to show you how much the, the game has changed in 25 years. First off, the sideline reporter tells uh, Ron and Mike that Scott Gallion is out with a concussion, can't remember anything <laughs> since the first quarter, and they're not sure if he's going to come back into the game. <laughs> and he does come back in. He plays in the second half. With, you know, he'd be, he might not play for two weeks today, and kind of in that same vein, that hit that Torrey Noel had in the third quarter of the sidelines. He's tossed from the game, like yeah, without, without even going to the yes. replay booth. Yes. That was vicious. They, they they just sent him to the locker room immediately <laughs> after he after the play ends. Yeah. yeah, that that's the shortest review. I mean, you don't even have to put the headphones on for that review because I mean, you're exactly right. He, he is he is so done and he and and targeting on that one. I tell you what else jumps out to, jumped out to me about this this team defensively. It, I've cheated, and, and we're going to do another 95 game next week. We're going to do the Ohio State win in the Citrus Bowl. But in watching some more of this 95 season, Shane Burton, number 84 for Tennessee on defense, was kind of a no-name guy, okay? I mean, Shane was a tight end who, who ended up, you know, switching over to defense. Two and sacks. He was a – but he had a great, a really nice career. Dan Brooks, 
you know, made him some money, made Shade some money in the NFL. He was a really good defensive lineman for Tennessee. He made a lot of plays in 95. He did this game. He does in the, in the Citrus Bowl game we'll do a week from now. Really underrated as a football player at Tennessee. You look at that defensive line. Steve White was opposite of Leonard Little. He played in the NFL for seven or eight years. Um, Shane Burton played in the NFL. Leonard Little played for a decade, better than a decade. I mean, there might not have been John Henderson or Albert Hainsworth in terms of that 300-pound guy in the middle, but, man, they were good on the defensive front up there. And and that's what Phillip had really established with his program moving forward was what they would do on the defensive line. Well, yeah, I, mean, I agree. Me, and, uh, I mean, go ahead. I thought the same thing as the game won. You know, Alabama wanted to run the football, obviously, with, with Freddie under center. And uh, just not, a you know, outside of Leonard – just not in, in exceptional talent, but just just really solid guys. Jonathan Brown is, is another one that was, you know, a solid player. Ron Green, and um, they, just like you said, I mean, they weren't you know great all pro type players, but they had a lot of dudes that uh that were way above average. Yeah, celebration. That go ahead, Austin. I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, it's a lot like the way Coach Coach Pruitt's trying to build the the team now with with the line of scrimmage. You know, defensive line, offensive line. Coach Fulmer had established himself through his coaching before he became head coach, a nice steady dose of offensive line depth. But you're right. You look at the, the quality of defensive linemen they had. They weren't like superstar household names, but they weren't scrubs. I mean, they were just solid, you know, and I think that's a, a huge compliment to a lot of players is to use that term. Um, you know, just every week you could really depend on them. They were dependable. And uh, you're right, Burton ended up going on to the NFL and having a nice career. Um, and, and, but, you know, Jonathan Brown kind of started, you see, you saw him start to build his career coming out of this game and, and the rest of that 95 season. You mentioned Pruitt. You mentioned Pruitt, AP. I could not find a participation chart for this game. I found the box score, but couldn't find the participation chart. You know, he was on that 95 Bama team and played in nine games that year. I do not know. I haven't asked him. Uh, should have, we should have asked him if, if he played in this game at all. I, I bet he found a minute or, or, or a snap or two at some point in that game. I would say about everybody on that Alabama sideline at some point probably got got into the game, whether you were ready, you know, whether they were grasping at straws or it was mop-up duty at, at the end of the game at that time because of the way Tennessee had controlled in the fourth quarter. The other thing, Jesse, you talked about this. When, when we did the 92 Florida game and the fact that Phillip got the job because of Florida and Alabama and what would have happened had they not converted fourth and 19 against Georgia or they had not won those games to, to set the stage for, for you know, the, the departure of Johnny Majors and, and Phillip Fulmer ascending to the top. This game to me in 95 was the validation of Phillip being a head coach but it also validated Philip Fulmer, two of Philip Fulmer's major decisions. One, John Chavis to be his defensive coordinator and the hiring of John Stuckey because Tennessee matched, exceeded Alabama's physicality in this game, which had not happened before. And Coach Fulmer had talked so much for a couple of years about changing the culture at Tennessee, being more physical, recruiting defensive linemen, and changing the way that they played. This was a real validation for him early in his career because, you know, he beat the big elephant, so to speak, and, and no pun intended there. Uh, and he did it with, with guys that he assembled in place, particularly Chavis and John Stuckey. Yeah, I mean, that's it's just I think it's just kind of the next part of the evolution. And, and again, you guys uh, have a much deeper history than I do, but but from watching – uh, the 92 game and reading about, you know, um, the impact of, of what that win meant for, for just kind of Fulmer in terms of, you know, in terms of the administration. Uh, and then for here, both those, both those hires that you just mentioned were, were, were pinnacle pieces, uh, for, for what would be, you know, the, the multiple SEC championships, but the, you know, particularly the 98, uh, national championship and, and kind of, uh, becoming what Tennessee was over the, basically this next you know three or four year run. How, how many people do you think were on the on the GQ were arrested that night, Rob? In, in ninety five <laughs> on the field, on the field because Tennessee fans came on the field and Birmingham police cuffed them and, and I'm, put I'm, them in the paddy wagon. I'm, I'm saying double digits easily. 
<laughs> if not, they will claim it anyway. I, I LWS just, ball for sure. <laughs> I remember the drive back because that was, you know, we drove back that night because we had to work the next morning. And um, believe it or not, stopped in um, – Stopped in uh, somewhere north of Birmingham. I can't remember exactly where. At a Shoney's breakfast bar because it's like one o'clock in the morning, one thirty in the morning, and it was packed with Tennessee fans in there um, of just uh, the elation and and almost the relief. Austin, it wasn't just there was so much excitement, and then it kind of, it was such a build up. Will they ever beat them again? Then they won the game, and Tennessee fans were kind of like they exhaled and was like, "Well, like, what do you do now?" You know what I'm saying? That's it. And there was a little bit of that at that point in time. Joey talks about that in a few minutes with us. But there was a little bit of just almost as much relief as there was excitement and, and joy in the win. Well, again, it's, uh, you know, to use a golf analogy, you know, if my putting's good, normally my irons or my driver's probably going to struggle. When you, you established your dot or started to establish your the swing of momentum in this series. And, of course, Florida started swinging. You know, the other way, right around the same time, you know, where, you know, Florida become what Alabama was as you were trying to get over the hump against the Gators. And so um, I, I think you always as a fan or, you're, you, you know, you're trying to find ways to, you know, stay hungry and, and, you know, you want, you know, you want more and more and more. But it's easy to you know, once you get the, the brass ring, so to speak, to look around and go, OK, what now? You know, and so, I mean, I think that's that's kind of, you know, common. Um, but I mean, you know, as we would see that, you know, in the coming years, Philip had his way against the, the, the Crimson Tide in, in so many ways throughout his entire career as head coach here. Well, and Stallings Rob, is out the next year. I mean, this, yes. this is kind of, this this game, you know, becomes kind of the opposite effect in terms of what we're talking about, from, you know, how it how it ignited Tennessee and ignited Peyton Manning's lore. And, you know, Philip Fulmer's decision making, you know, in terms of staff for Alabama, this was kind of the downturns coming. You know, they, you know, 92, the SEC championship game, 96, they had the big season. This was, or 94, I mean, th- this was, uh, this was the downturn. Stallings is out the next year, and then they kind of go through that rut here, you know, after that. And Rob, as we close it out here, nothing made Philip Fulmer happier than beating Alabama. Oh, no. And, and it got to the point, I mean, it was a hate, hate relationship between Philip Fulmer and Alabama fans. I mean, which, you know, I, I guess is, you, you expect when you go on a seven game win streak, but I could I mean, good gracious, Hubbard. Do you remember the early days of all quest and just the rivals network, just the vitriol that Alabama fans had had for Philip Fulmer kind of culminated in, uh, in the subpoena at SEC media days. Yeah. The, <laughs> the one it, year. Well, it was funny for nine years, Alabama was in Tennessee's head every way possible. And then Philip Fulmer got in Alabama's head every way possible for a long period of time. That's for sure. It started all on this night in 1995, the, 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 the history, the momentum in this series took a dramatic turn that night, starting with play number one and capped off, as Austin said, with a smoke-filled Legion Stadium, Legion Field of Tennessee fans who celebrated throughout the night on the way back up uh, I-59 and, and up I-75 back to Knoxville or Nashville, up 65, wherever they were heading. A great night in Tennessee history. We're going to find out more about it from Joey Kent coming up on the Blue Water uh, Climate Control BallQuest.com podcast on this Rocky Top Rewind edition. Continuing our look at the 1995 Tennessee-Alabama game in this Rocky Top Rewind, and we welcome to the program now Joey Kent, kind of a big factor in this game. Alabama native, got things started on the first play from scrimmage. Joey, thanks for joining us, and it, it's one of the most iconic plays when you talk about Tennessee and, and what this thing looks like and, and how that game went. What do you remember maybe in the locker room before taking the field about that game. And, and, and then we'll just specifically get into the play. Go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, typically we scripted the first 12, 13 plays of every game. And we got the game plan the night before, and I saw what the play was. And so my first thought was, you know, look, we're going to be aggressive against Alabama because we all knew the history of that um, particular series at the time. And I was really excited about, um, that very first play. Obviously, I didn't know how that was going to go, what that was going to look like, but I just knew from the night before that we were going to be aggressive. And I was excited, you know, when I woke up that next morning that, you know, we're going to get this thing started fast. I uh, talked to Peyton before the game because typically it took maybe a, a, a quarter or a series or two before I kind of got involved into the game plan. 
And I told him, I was like, look, man, I, I want to, I want the ball early and often in this game. I just had a good feeling about a particular game plan because we, we worked our tail off that, that, that week four for the Alabama game. And, um, we had a great game plan going in and I just felt really good about, especially that, that first series of what we could potentially do. I got to ask you about the play. I mean, when you got to the line of scrimmage, did you know what it was? Did, did you know, hey, this thing's got a chance to go? It's got a chance to be a 15-yard play. It's got a chance to be the, the home run. I mean, when, when you break the huddle and you know the play call, what, what are you thinking when, you, when you're lined up at the line of scrimmage? So the play was 60 bass, and what it consisted of, it was four wide receiver set. Two outside guys ran a hitch route, which was a five-yard route, stop route, basically. Two inside guys were, were myself and Marcus Nash. And it depended on the coverage, um, like against cover two, my job is to basically split the, the safeties because in cover two, the, the, the safeties uh, have to go to their responsibility, which is the hash. And so my responsibility on cover two would be to split those two guys right down the middle of the field. When we broke the huddle, um, I noticed they were in cover three. And typically with that four receiver set, nobody played as cover three for whatever reason. Um, and so when we broke the huddle, I noticed they were in cover three and Peyton and I, if you can look at, you can go back and look at the tape. When we lined up, Peyton and I kind of locked eyes and I can see the incitement in his eyes. And I, I'm pretty sure he felt the same way for me, but we didn't want to give it away. Kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, we were, and we're, I think we were both hoping that they would stay in cover three because it gave us the best chance to have a big play. Um, cause we ran that play a thousand times, you know, years before. And, you know, it was typically, you know, a 15, 20, 25 yard, um, play. So we knew it was going to be a big play, but we just didn't know how big. And, um, obviously they stayed in cover three. I split the, the corner and the safety. That was my job just to split those two guys and run a streak down the field. And once I caught it, um, I, I felt the safety kind of overrun it. And so that's the reason why I undercut him. And after that, man, I was just trying to run and not get caught because that was one of the rules as a receiver and uh, as a group that after you, you know, after you catch the ball and you have an open lane to the, to the end zone, you can't get caught. So that was going through my mind. Like, I know I need to score because if I don't, my guys are going to kill me um, when we get back into the, um, and, and to watch the film. And so, um, obviously I didn't know it was going to be that big. And, um, you know, after I scored out, obviously I was excited about it, um, guys, but I mean, that was just the first play of the game. So, I mean, it's, it's still, even though it's ADR's first play of the game, it was only six points. And so I, I knew how good Alabama was that, that year. So, um, I, I was excited about the play, but I knew, um, that it was going to be a long game and we still had a lot of game left. Joey, when you're, you know, trying to get over the hump in a series and kind of reverse the fortune of, uh, of years past, to have that kind of jolt early on, how much did it change the belief? I mean, I know it's easy to be confident going in, but it's a game you've not won in several years outside of the tie in 93. How, how big was that play, looking back on it, for the belief system of that team? Uh, I think you're right. It did give a jolt, obviously a jolt to the offense. It gave offense confidence. Um, but we had confidence really going in. I think if you ask the you know, the team to a man, how confident did, did we feel about winning that game? And I think everybody would say, we're going to win this game because we just, again, we had a really good week of practice and we just felt confident, even though the streak was what it was. Um, we felt confident that we can go down there and put on a good show offensively and, and, and do a good job. And, you know, I can't say, you know, obviously my play started that, but you, know, you look at the defense and what they did, special teams, you know, interceptions. I think everybody played on their highest level in that game. And I always say that, you know, that game, we could have beat anybody in the country. I, you know, we ended up only, um, you know, won 11 games and lost one. And obviously if they had the playoff system back then, we would have been probably one of the top two or three, four teams in that, in that particular system. But that particular night, I feel like we could have beat anybody in the country. Joey, when you look at this, you mentioned the confidence in, in the week that you had had. I remember as a, a guy just getting started, I think it's my second or third year covering the program and covering the team on a daily basis. There was so much talk about Brother Oliver's defense versus Peyton. It, mm -hmm. You know, it was it was about 
um, how could you know how could Peyton handle all the complexity of the brother Oliver defense? You, you mentioned you guys had a good week. I mean, can, can you just? I mean, Peyton was still a sophomore, you know, and and you were you know you weren't the, the oldest guy on the team either. I mean, how how did you guys come into that game with so much confidence? given the, the heralded defense that you were going against? I think it started during the summer. Um, it, you know, Brent, we, you know, back then, and you know, people people can say that Florida, maybe Georgia now is a team that, that you would want to beat the most. But, you know, I'm old enough to, to say that back during my time, it was still Alabama. And so that's what we were kind of gearing up toward throughout the summer. That's what we talked about. You know, Florida was there. We talked about them also. But Alabama was still on the top of mind every day during the summertime, and that's what we were gearing up to. And and so when the Alabama week finally came, it was easy for our guys to buy in for and be locked in um, from that Sunday Monday um, practice. And um, you could just tell it's just a different sense of confidence. I can't really pinpoint you know plays and what we did during practice, but it was just a different sense of confidence because we knew that it was a lot riding on this game um, for the university, for us as players, for the coaches. Uh, I just remember just, you know, a guy from, being from Alabama, just going to bed during the summer, thinking about what it would feel like to be Alabama. I mean, that's how, that's how in tune I was um, at that time to, you know, f- to beat, to beat Alabama. And, and I, I've talked to other guys that say the same thing. It was just one of those deals where we, you know, you feel like, Enough is enough, and it's it's our time to to make a statement against Alabama and break that streak. Did, did I mean you guys were close in '93 with the tie, and I know not everybody was there, but on the team. But '93 was a tie. '94, even with a freshman quarterback, yeah. you had a chance late. How much confidence did it give you that? Hey, yeah, it's it's a streak, but it's not all of us. All of us haven't lost eight games in a row, nine games in a row to Alabama. Look how close we were. We should have won the last two games. How much did that help kind of fuel you and, and also give the confidence for you guys? Yeah, I think it played a part in it. Um, and you got to look at our, our seniors that year. You talk about the Bubba Millers, you know, all those guys that, that went through all that before, um, you know, before I got there and, and while I was there, you know, those guys were so in tune and so, um, you know, they, they wanted to go out their last year um, beating Alabama because, I mean, that's that's something to be said. You know, you always want to, you know, you, you always know your record against, you, you know, your Alabama, your Florida, your Georgia, right? You know, I can rattle, I can rattle those records off and I'll, I'll do that for, forever. Um, but you always want to go out, go out on top as a senior. And I know how important it was to those guys and what they talked about. You had guys. Um, you know, senior guys that, that stepped up, um, in the, in the, in the meeting, um, that, that, that Friday night to say how important this game was to talk to the younger guys who maybe didn't know the importance of this game or, or the importance of, of getting a victory over, over Bama. And I just, just remember that feeling that Friday night of, you know, this is, this is our, this is our time. This is our chance. We had a great, really good week of practice. Um, we have, you know, even though Peyton was a younger quarterback, he's, he's still one of the better quarterbacks in the country. We have an offense that can move the ball. We have a game plan that was going to be aggressive. So all those factors, um, gave us a lot of confidence. So what's the second? Joey, when the, you look at, go ahead, go ahead Austin. Joey, when you, you look at this team, a lot of, and in this game in particular, you had a lot of big plays in this game. You had obviously Jay had a huge run, uh, down the far sideline. But the other one a lot of people talk about besides the, the play from number one, play number one is Peyton's naked bootleg. Oh, so yeah. Just kind of talk about your vantage point on that play. I know Jay will, Jay will be quick to tell you, you know, he didn't tell him. He just kind of put it in his belly and then yanked it away, and the rest is history. Yeah, it was. I was asking on the sideline. There was jumbo packets, and so um, during jumbo packets, I, I wasn't in at the time, and I knew the play. I, I, I heard the play was going to be, you know, obviously going to be a running play. And I mean, you're right. Peyton didn't tell anybody because he wanted the offensive line. He wanted the running backs to run that play like it was a run. And, um, I, that, I mean, it, it takes a lot of guts to do that. We've seen that happen, um, this past year and <laughs> kind of go the opposite way. Um, but it was obviously a different, <laughs> <laughs> obviously a different, different play, obviously, and, um, different style play too. So, 
Um, it took a lot of guts for him to do it. I, I'm pretty sure Coach Cutcliffe gave him the green light to do it, though. Um, and it just worked. It, you know, it worked perfectly. It, the, the lineman, the lineman shot off like it was a run. Jay jumped over the pile and was, was you can just, you can see the replay. You can kind of look at him, look back like, Hey, I'm supposed to have the ball here. I'm supposed to score. And, um, Peyton just kind of strolled in, man. It was, again, it was just one of those perfect nights, um, for, for Tennessee football. And, um, it was a, it was a night that, that I'll never forget, man, in the locker room after the game and, you know, the governor coming in and us singing and, it felt like we were in a locker room for like two or three hours. We got back to Knoxville really late. Um, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, it's probably about four or five o'clock we got back to Knoxville and I'm thinking it's going to be just pandemonium going on in Knoxville, but it was so late that, you know, it was just kind of quiet on campus when we got back. And I just remember going back to the dorm room and just laying in the bed and just, just with a big smile on my face, just knowing that, hey, we did it. Um, and we're part of history. We're part of a team that, um, that, that, that broke the streak and, and the way we did it, it, there, there was no denying that, that we beat Alabama. It, it wasn't given to us. It, there were, you know, turnovers that, that, you know, caused us to, to, to win the game. We, we went down to Birmingham and basically and took that game. And, um, again, it's, it's, you know, I still get chills from it, you know, just kind of thinking about it, you know, just my teammates and how happy the seniors were. How happy Coach Fulmer were was at the time, and my you know coaches, staff, um, just just the happiness in that that locker room. I, I'll never forget that. That's probably the happiest I've been in a locker room on any level, from high school to professional level. And I you know we you know I've been on a team that that went to the Super Bowl, but that particular night, um, it was just it was just a really awesome feeling that that again I'll never forget. You, you ever taken your kids down to Legion Field? I mean, they don't play the game there anymore, but obviously that's that's you know kind of a, a special place you know for the, for the game we're talking about. I mean, you ever taken your kids and kind of showed I, them, hey, this you yeah. know, we, we didn't play this one in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, I actually have. It was probably about four or five years. So I have a sixteen year old daughter and a thirteen year old son now. So it's probably about four, five, six years ago. I still have family in Birmingham. My actually, my great grandmother lived in the projects right across from Legion Field. So when I would go to see my great grandmother, I mean I would I would see Legion Field as a as a boy. And then my father um was a coach at Alabama AM. So they played the Magic City Classic at Legion Field every year. So I would go to literally go to Legion Field every year as as long as I remember to either a game or to see my great grandmother and I would just see the field and never did I would imagine um, as a kid that I would be on that stage in that particular stadium um, and, and play that game um, the way we did. And to answer your question, yes, I, I've taken them there. They, they kind of looked at me like, you know, why are we here? <laughs> I, tried, I tried to explain to them what, you know, the significance of that, you know, stadium is to me was to me um and they still kind of looked at me with like i had three eyes and so we just kind of i quietly kind of gathered them put them back in the car and we left so uh <laughs> they were they were um they were young but they they know they know the significance of that game and um how i feel about you know tennessee and how i feel about alabama they know that um that, that's something they know for sure I got to ask you joey i mean you mentioned that the, the opening play you had to remind yourself Hey, that's just the first play of the game. We've got 59 minutes and whatever seconds left in this game. Was there a moment in the fourth quarter or in the third quarter where maybe you were sitting on the bench or you're standing on the sideline and you kind of look up at the scoreboard and you kind of went, wow, we just, we just beat, we're beating the brakes off them. Like this game is over. Did you, did you have a moment on the sideline where you did before you got to the locker room, before the end game celebration where you kind of looked up and went, yeah. Wow, this this has really happened. We we really just took care of business. I was actually in the game, and that was it was a Jay Graham touchdown run, and I he ran over to my side, and and um not saying that my block did anything or didn't do anything, but I was blocking for him. I block it was a it was a cover looked like it seemed like it was a cover three. So instead of me going to the corner trying to block the corner, I, um the safety came down, so I blocked the safety, and he made the corner miss. 
I just remember just kind of being on the ground and, you know, getting to a knee and just seeing him run. And at that point, I knew it was over. I, I thought that was the point where, you know, they that, that run kind of broke their back, um, you know, so to speak. And that was that was the point of the game where I knew that, you know, we're, we're going to win this game. And um, this is this is history being made within the program and how happy, you know, what I thought I was thinking about how happy, you know, obviously the coaches and, and the and the players were at the time. But just think about the fans and and, you know, the people that were in the stadium and just people around the country that are so that were satisfied and very happy of, you know, what we did that night. And um, it was just a lot. It was a lot of emotions um, during that time. And. And again, in the locker room after the game, we kind of stayed on the field a little bit and celebrated with the fans in the corner of the end zone. I remember all that. And I remember, you know, the flag waving. I, I just remember everything. The cigar smoking in the locker room, um, Governor Sunquist um, singing along with us. You know, the I Don't Give a Damn song. Where I, I don't know if they sing that anymore, but I just remember. Oh, all they do. Oh, they do. <laughs> Tennessee's just not got to sing in a while, boy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I just remember all that and, and the, it seemed like, and there's footage of it, but the footage is, is, is like, it's, it's, it's really foggy and it's just, I mean, it's just, I just remember all that and, um, and hugging my, my, you know, my mom and dad and my brother and I had cousins there. I had aunts there because, you know, obviously I have family in Birmingham. Just, it was, um, it was a magical night for the program. Um, something that, you know, at the time, even after the game, I didn't realize the, you know, the true significance of it. Um, cause, you know, again, I'm, I'm still a, basically a kid and, you know, you don't really think of things, uh, like 20, 25, 30 years down the line. You don't think of like how this will change the trajectory of the program, how this might be talked about, you know, 20 years down. I didn't, I wasn't thinking on that level. Um, but, it, it's, it's something to, you know, to be said for this, you know, that particular game or that particular play to be talked about. And, and it was part of Tennessee um, history. And that, that, that makes me proud. So what are you into these days, man? You mentioned you, you mentioned you got your young ones. What, what are you doing these days? I feel like I'm an Uber driver for them. <laughs> I know. I, I got more. I'm that world. I understand. <laughs> I think everybody can, you know, who has younger kids can relate. Now my daughter, she's um 16, so she's driving. So that's another anxiety level. Um, but yeah, really involved with them as far as, um, you know, they're, they're, my daughter runs or ran tracks. I don't know if she's going to do it, um, be able to do it because of everything that's going on um, and play soccer at Brentwood High School. And my son, um, he plays basketball and football. So they keep me busy. My, you know, I, on my day to day, I'm a, you know, I'm a biopharmaceutical rep for, for a company. I've been doing that for about 15, 16 years now. So both of those keep me busy. Um, the honeydew list, it seems like since everything's going on, it's gotten, gotten a little bit longer, but I have time to do it. So, um, it's been good. Life is, life is good, man. You know, I, I'm here in Nashville, you know, was drafted by the Titans and um and just made Nashville home and it, it's been a perfect mix for me because you know I have a lot of friends here and I'm able to get down to Huntsville where my mom still lives. You know, it's just an hour and a half down the road. So life is good, man. I have I really have no complaints um personally of 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 everything that's happened. All right, Joey, let's cut to the chase. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you out the door on this. All Vol fans are gonna listen to this interview. They're gonna know one thing. Is your kid any good at football? He's 13. <laughs> and, and and then two, when 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 they when they they did the the uh, when they honored Peyton a few years ago, he threw one final honorary pass. What that mean to you to be selected to be the guy that come caught that pass? Um, first of all, I was scared to death. Um, he, I was coming to the game anyway for you know his um his presentation. Um, but he called or he sent a text the night, like the, that afternoon when I was, we were, I was driving with my family and I got a text from him saying that, Hey, you know, this is what I have planned. Um, are you, are you able to do it? And obviously I said yes, but after I got off the phone, I was like, Oh my gosh, I haven't caught a, I really haven't caught a pass in like years. Like, you know, you, obviously I've tossed a 
the ball around with my son, but that's different from catching a a 45 yard pass from Peyton Manning with you know 90,000 people in the stands. You know what I mean? I was so I was I was re- literally scared that night before. I was scared like it was like I was playing the next day. Like I was like nervous, like because you don't want like he specifically called me obviously, but I didn't want to be the person to mess that moment up for him because it was a big moment for him. He wanted that to to happen. So I was I was nervous. And I just, it seemed like the ball was in slow motion, like it always did, was, like when he threw a pass, like a long pass to me, and it seemed like everything got quiet again. And I was just relieved after I caught it. Um, and my, I, my, my son, who you referred to earlier, his last words for me when I left him, he was like, um, don't embarrass me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to do it. And I was, I was like, that made me more nervous because my son is looking at me, if I drop this, pass in front of him I've never been able to live this down um but um it, it was um it was a it was a that was a fun day even though I Tennessee did not do well at all that I remember that didn't do didn't, they didn't do well at all that game but that particular experience was um something that that was um I, I, I'll never forget and to answer your question about my son he's he's okay he's uh he's a seventh grader um he plays receiver he plays defensive back he started as a as a seventh grader on the seventh and they have a seventh and eighth grade team. So he started as a seventh grader. The good thing about him is, is that, um, he wants to be good. And so I don't have a lot of like, it's, there's not a lot of instances or any instance where I force him to do anything, basketball or football. Um, for football, he, you know, when, you know, maybe about a month before football season starts, he, you know, he wants to go out to the local high school and run routes and catch and um, learn, um, which which makes me excited. You know, that's that's one thing I, I can say about him that he wants to be good. And so we'll see. Um, he 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 can catch it. He definitely can catch it. He probably can catch it better than me at his age, um, because he's he's all hands. He's a hands catcher, and I and I kind of split both ways. I was a hand catcher when I when I had to, but. Um, I, I use my body some too, but he's all hands. So that excites me. He can run routes. He, he knows the concepts, which I didn't know route concepts and how to run routes until I actually got to Tennessee. And so he knows how to run routes as a seventh grader and why you run routes. Why, why do you attack the, the, the cornerback and try to step on his toes? What leverage? What, you know, he knows all that, which is good. So it's exciting. So we'll, to answer your question, we'll see. I, I don't what know. Number, what numbers do you wear, Joey? Um, in basketball, he wears 11. Um, as a seventh grader, he was not able to pick his number because, you know, you had eighth graders that had the first choice. Um, but he, he definitely he wants to wear a number 11 like Pops. He definitely, he definitely loves 11. That's his number. Um, so we'll, we'll see, man. I, I'm excited to see what, what the future holds for him. Um, obviously he needs to kind of grow and develop. Um, but this is the fun part for me is, is just enjoying life and enjoying my kids and watching them compete, watch my daughter compete. And cause I know I, you know, I, you never get this time back. Once this time is over, you know, I, t- I have friends that are, um, have kids that are, you know, out of high school and college now. And, and that's, you know, when I talk to them, that's what they miss the most of just seeing their kids develop and compete and play. And so every time, every opportunity that I get, I'm there. I'm present. You know, I, I give advice. You know, a lot of times my son doesn't want to listen to my advice, but I give it to him anyway, and uh, good, bad, or ugly. Um, so it, this is this is this is perfect time for me just to be able to enjoy them and enjoy life, and um, I'm excited. I'm excited for what what they're going to accomplish. You know, on the field and off the field. Well, it's been great catching up with you, Joey. I remember back the year before, 94, at Starkville, Mississippi, because that's when that Peyton Manning-Joey Kent combination really started yeah. to form at that point. What a special day, even though that one didn't end well. But that's when that connection really started. And then everyone has etched in their minds that 95 game in Alabama. Thanks for joining us here on the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast, our Rocky Top Rewind. We certainly appreciate it, my man. All right. Thanks, Britt. Thanks, Austin. Y'all have a good day.